but of course it is a very interesting time in Congress. And in addition to everything we're doing on the legislative front, we engage in a lot of issues to support affordable housing and housing credit on the regulatory side. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can hear all the buzz around multifamily housing. With all the info you need to help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Hi, I'm Don Bernards, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Gary Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Let's get started. Garrick and I have been discussing various legislative topics around affordable housing. And one piece, of course, of the legislation getting a lot of attention in the industry is the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act of 2023, or AHCIA. To get us up to speed on this, what the industry can do to help out and other related topics, we are very excited to have as our guest in the Buzz House today a great friend of the industry, well-known industry advocate, Emily Kotick, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition. As I noted today, most of our discussion will be around the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act of 2023, touching on how do we get here, where is here, what's next, and some details within the legislation. We'll also touch on, of course, how to get involved with supporting the aforementioned legislation. Uh, Thank you very much, Emily, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Perfect. Now, Garrick and I are going to actually jump right into questions with Emily, so I'm going to turn it over to Garrick. Thanks, Don, and thanks, Emily, for being on Buzz House. Before we jump into some questions, uh, why don't you give our listeners some insight into your background and work with Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition? Sure. So I've been leading the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition for the past six years. We are a coalition of 260 organizations and businesses that advocate for the low-income housing tax credit. We've been around since 1988. We represent all parts of the affordable housing community. Uh, all parts of the country. And it's very powerful when we are able to go to the Hill or to the administration and say we have full consensus from all parts of the affordable housing community, the investors, syndicators, developers, state agencies, nonprofits, and for-profits. And that's allowed us to have some very significant wins for the low-income housing tax credit over uh, many decades. We are about as well positioned as we possibly could be to have some more over the next few weeks here. But of course, it is a very interesting time in Congress. And in addition to everything we're doing on the legislative front, we engage in a lot of issues to support affordable housing and the housing credit on the regulatory side. So we focus a lot on issues like the Community Reinvestment Act. Now we're looking at Basel III rules. We look at different IRS regulations. We were really involved in income averaging regulations, 8609s, uh, a lot of different issues that I'm sure many outside of the community may hear a lot of numbers and acronyms, but we all know uh, have a really big impact for affordable housing. And my background before that, I started my career at the Department of Housing and Urban Development and had a really interesting position where I got to see what public housing looked like in all parts of the country and what it looks like in Baltimore versus Seattle versus Boulder. And that really got me bought in on on housing policy, spent a few years with Enterprise Community Partners, and then came on to lead the coalition, like I said, a few years ago. So it's a really great community to be part of. We really appreciate uh, all of our members like Baker Tilly, uh, who have been joining us to speak with one voice in support of the low-income housing tax credit. Great, Emily. Thank you for that background. Again, thank you for all that that you and, and, and the coalition do, of course, for, for this industry. Emily, for our listeners who maybe haven't been following in detail the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, would you be able to give us some highlights of actually what is included in the act, you know, as well as, you know, the impact? We know housing is such such shortage and such issues in, in all parts of the country, as you noted. We know that there are items in the act that right affect both 9% and the 4% credits. Yeah, so the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act has been around in some shape or form since 2016. And the way I describe it is really the menu of options of policies that would promote strengthening and expanding the low-income housing tax credit. So every major win that we've had for the low-income housing tax credit since then has come out of the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, even if the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act itself has not, and almost uh, certainty will not on its own ever move through Congress. So when we got the minimum 4% rate set that came out of here When we got the first expansion of the housing credit in a decade, the 12.5% allocation increase we got in 2018 that we're trying to extend right now, that came out of here. 
income averaging came out of here. And so the foundation of the bill has been the same since then. We've we've always had roughly two dozen or so provisions, the linchpin of which is a 50% expansion of the housing credit allocation increase. But depending on some of these other factors, we there have been provisions that have been removed because they were enacted, like the ones I just mentioned. There have been a few new additions as things have changed. But part of the strategy has always been to keep the the coalition intact that's been supporting this piece of legislation. Because while it is lengthy, there are a lot of different pieces of, of the AHCIA, as we call it, that attract different supporters, both in the industry and in Congress. So for example, the rural basis boost, this would provide an extra 30% for any properties in rural areas. There's one for, for Native American communities. There's one for extremely low income households, which would be a higher boost of 50%. And the different members of Congress, and again, groups in the industry that really push for these things, if you start breaking up this bill, you could start losing this pretty powerful and very bipartisan coalition that we have. So most of it is intact. The key pieces for the last few years have been that 50% allocation increase and the more recent addition, which became more urgent after the 4% rate lock was set, is uh, lowering the 50% bond financing test down to 25%. So now that the 4% side of the program is functioning like it should, now so many states are oversubscribed in their bond cap. And what started as an issue facing uh, some of the states you might expect, like New York and Massachusetts and California, is now affecting Alabama and Texas and Florida and Tennessee. And so we have been able to build a pretty broad constituency for that change as well to lower the 50% test. Um, those two pieces alone have the, by far the biggest impact of all of the proposals in the AHCIA. Those get you over 1.5 million more affordable homes over the next 10 years. And, and actually the bond test gets you the vast share of them. That's about 1.4 million affordable homes if that provision were made permanent. And these are all thanks to uh, Novogratik, who has been uh, churning out estimates on all our legislative proposals for many years. The increase in the 9% allocation, and this is if you got a 50% increase on the 9% side, that's about 230,000 affordable homes over the next 10 years than otherwise possible. And then the other provisions that really have an impact on production are all the basis boosts I mentioned. So in addition to the population or regional specific ones, like the extremely low income rural and native boosts, the one that actually has the biggest impact is one that would provide a state discretionary basis boost so that you could provide what's available on the 9% side, the 30% basis boost were needed to any deal on the 4% side. So those are the next tier of impact. After that, most of the provisions in the AHCIA are streamlining and good governance type provisions. They are, I would say, less likely to advance in this Congress than the ones that have the bigger impact on affordable housing production, since we are in such a affordable housing supply crisis. But the bill is still hanging together as this large set of proposals, even if based on the uh, political realities and possibilities in any given Congress, you know, usually we're looking at maybe a handful or, or fewer that actually have a realistic chance of getting across the finish line. Perfect. No, thank you for that in-depth kind of analysis and, and breakdown and, and impact, Emily. You touched on right in the past two, three, four or five years, there's been a, a similar Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. Various pieces have, have come up. You know, we read a lot, you know, from, from the coalition, from other industry advocates, there seems to be a lot, and you mentioned the bipartisan support. There's a lot in, in key committees and so forth. Is that how does that feel? How does that look like the level of support we have, you know, as of this recording, look to the prior few years? We have a lot more support. It's more bipartisan, and we got it faster than in previous years. And so part of the strategy of keeping the bill largely intact, I referred a couple of times to wanting to keep our coalition. We ended the last Congress, the 117th Congress, with uh, almost 50% of Congress signed on. We had 47% of the entire Congress signed on to this long bill about the low-income housing tax credit. So that's something that we wanted to be able to recreate. We had the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, the current chairman, Jason Smith, signed on last year. That's huge. The idea is kind of, hey, if, if Jason Smith signed on to this bill, let's reintroduce something pretty similar to what he signed on to. 
So now, even though the legislation was only introduced in May of this year, or 2023, I guess we're in 2024 now, we already have 202 co-sponsors in the House evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. That's obviously a, a strategy to keep things as bipartisan as possible. And we have 30 senators in the Senate, again, evenly divided. So we uh, maxed out at 11 Senate Republicans in the last Congress. Now we have 15, and there's still a few more who may yet get on. On the House side, in addition to the uh, the 202 I mentioned, we actually just heard about four more getting on today, and hopefully by the time this podcast airs, there'll be even more. So even in this House that you know there were questions about, are they going to be able to lift the debt ceiling to fund the government? They didn't have a speaker for three weeks. You know, we have almost half of this House evenly divided between parties signed on to this uh, low income housing tax credit legislation, which is really remarkable. It's a testament to the industry working together over many years to build this bipartisan support. And one thing that's significant this year compared to prior years is how much farther up we've gone in leadership to get supporters. So several of the people whose names were floated for Speaker of the House have signed on. Uh, just today, we learned that Chair of the House Republican Conference, Elise Stefanik, signed on. This isn't just a piece of legislation where you're only able to attract moderates or only in you know tough races. We're really breaking into you know everyone from the, the Progressive Caucus, the Squad, to the Freedom Caucus. We have members on key committees, members in leadership. So one of the questions I get most often is, if you have all of the support, why doesn't it just get a vote? And unfortunately, tax legislation is just a really... Uh, you you could have clearly half the House signed on and it still doesn't mean that this piece of legislation will be included in anything. So we've done the work to lay the groundwork and make it as easy as possible if there is a piece of tax legislation moving where we could hopefully include some of these provisions. But it is both attracting all of these supporters, but making sure that they also engage whenever something does actually start coming together in Congress, because those calls that the the 200 you know, now 206 House members make or the 30 senators make to leadership and to committee chairs saying we need any tax bill to include the low income housing tax credit. That's really the the second stage of advocacy after spending these last few months building up a truly impressive level of bipartisan support. But now we have to channel that into uh, actually getting something across the finish line. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And and that kind of leads to my next question, because it sounds like there's plenty of support for this bill. So as a follow up to, to this last question, where do we actually sit today? And what does a potential process look like to actually getting this passed? So today we are, I would say, closer to getting these, at least these key production provisions across the finish line than we have been in probably a couple of years. The pieces that are most likely to advance in this Congress, of course, there's a lot of focus on costs and spending. So the full Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act is unfortunately not on the table. But that 12.5% allocation increase that we got in 2018 that expired at the end of 2021, that's a true, quote, tax extender. That is one that I know there's a lot of focus on not baking in this cut to the main affordable housing production program at this time of staggering need. The other piece is lowering the 50% test. Uh, that's something that some of the uh, members in key leadership positions have some of the states that are most desperate to see the 50% test lowered, like New York. So those are the two that have the best shot in this Congress. We know that they... the. The dynamics that prevented a tax bill from advancing in 2022 have changed significantly. So the broader tax bill and the, the engines that are really driving it are on the Republican side, the need to extend some of the business tax extenders like research and development, business expensing, bonus depreciation. And on the Democratic side, they're looking for extension and expansion of the child tax credit. And at the end of 2022, the two sides were so far apart on their asks that the negotiations never got off the ground in earnest, which uh, matters to us in the affordable housing industry, because without a broader tax bill, there was really no opening up of the tax code whatsoever. And so even though we had 47% of Congress signed on, there was kind of no home for these housing credit provisions. That has changed significantly. The talks have been 
positive all through 2023, starting over the summer. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Jason Smith and the Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden, despite being in different parties and all the partisan gridlock we hear about in D.C., they actually talk regularly. They seem to kind of <laughs> kind of like each other, <laughs> and um, they've they've really wanted to do a tax bill together. And the asks this year are also much closer than they were in the prior year. So we had been talking with them all through you know the second half of 2023, trying to figure out what a tax bill might look like and how the housing credit fits in if they're able to strike an agreement on some of these bigger issues. Of course, we had an interesting end of the year in 2023 with what normally happens is this flurry of legislative activity that ends right before Christmas. But of course, the continuing resolution with these two new funding deadlines created a dynamic that pushed a lot of the year-end legislative activity from December into now early January. So we have a first funding deadline on January 19th and a second on February 2nd. They are currently looking at the time of this recording at trying to attach a tax bill to any government funding bill that might pass on January 19th. Now, that means a lot of things have to happen. There's a lot of uh, debate right now about what to do about the border. Every single time government funding is about to run, to run out, it looks like there might be a shutdown. So there's a lot of pieces that have nothing to do with tax that need to come together for something to even happen at the January 19th deadline. But the tax committees are trying to finalize this agreement on all the tax provisions so that if some if a train starts leaving the station, they can attach this tax bill to it. So our task right now is to make sure if there is a vehicle, if they are able to come to an agreement on the business extenders and child tax credit, that they have to make room for the low-income housing tax credit. Because if, if they are able to accomplish a tax bill right now, it is very, very unlikely there will be another tax bill before 2025. That's what they're starting to call the Super Bowl of tax because all of these uh, tax reform provisions are expiring then. And we know there will be a tax bill in 2025 and every other tax provision will likely just have the can kicked until the end of that year. We in the affordable housing industry know that we can't wait that long to do something about affordable housing and that we have all of these shovel ready developments ready to go uh, if they could just squeeze us into this tax bill. So we are currently pulling out all of the stops to make sure that, again, even though you, we've got over you know, 200 co-sponsors, we need all of those co-sponsors calling leadership and saying, you can't let a tax bill go without the low-income housing tax credit, because it would be very easy for them to draw the line right after child tax credit business extenders say, you know, we cut the deal, let's not start adding too much, let's not load this up. And we're trying to make the case that this is a win for everybody. And of course, it's great policy, but even politically that, you know, we've got we've got so much support here that you can't leave something like this out. So I hope that by the time of this airing, <laughs> we are looking back at what could be the biggest win for the low income housing tax credit in in several years. Uh, it's also possible that there will still they'll buy themselves some more time. Maybe the February 2nd deadline becomes more possible. But at some point pretty soon here. Everything will shut down for election season, whether we're ready or not. And there's going to be very little meaningful legislation until the end of the year. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, it does sound like there is some momentum and obviously we got to get something done. So that being said, you know, we, I wanted to maybe bring up another piece of legislation. We recently saw some information around the workforce housing tax credit. Would you be able to let our listeners know some highlights from that proposed legislation? And also, how does this introduction of this list this legislation either pair with the AHCIA or what is the overall strategy with this proposed legislation? Yeah, sure. So the workforce housing tax credit is what many may have remembered as the middle income housing tax credit or MITEC. The idea was to take MITEC and pick up where it left off and model something similar to it, but but for that middle income range. This has been a huge passion project for Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden. He's been spearheading the effort for many years. The new version of the legislation pairs better with the low income housing tax credit than the previous ones. In the previous version, a state, if they did not use their allocation for the middle income levels, the following year they could roll it over into a 9% LIHTC allocation. This new version, the state could use it for middle income 
or a low income housing tax credit right away. So it's essentially a a LIHTC plus up that could also be used for middle income. So, you know, we we have as at the coalition, we haven't endorsed the middle income housing tax credit because as our name suggests, <laughs> we just do the low income housing tax credit. But this is a much more compatible and LIHTC friendly version. And they also made some other tweaks to make it more compatible with the program. Given how difficult it is to even get what is literally the most bipartisan popular tax bill in Congress to get any piece of it in a tax bill. I have doubts about getting the middle income tax credit or the, the workforce housing tax credit included. However, you know, if there is a tax bill, Ron Wyden is going to be going to be writing a big part of it. And I think if it does have a shot, it, it would be because he would insist that they carve out some space for the middle income or the, the workforce credit in there. I do think it's getting more interest. This is the first year they've had Republicans sign on. Dan Sullivan from Alaska is a, a bipartisan co-sponsor in the Senate this year. There's a Republican in the House as well. So it is gaining more attention. And I think it's because of the same reason you know, what we what we know too well, which is affordable housing is becoming uh, an issue that members are hearing about in states where maybe they weren't hearing about it before. So I think it has a shot someday. If it's not this year, I would be surprised if it weren't more seriously on the table in 2025 as part of uh, maybe some more changes on the housing front. But it's uh, it's definitely something that has a lot of interest in the industry, especially among you know groups like Multi Housing Council and the Home Builders, and a growing constituency in Congress as well. Emily, thank you for that for those overviews. Switching subjects briefly, just maybe maybe somewhat quickly, two other quick questions that have kind of obviously hitting our light tech space. The first is, you know, early, early on uh, in the introduction, Emily, you mentioned, you know, Community Reinvestment Act, CRA. We've been a couple of months since the legislation came out, I think in early November. Are there any takeaways yet? The early info we had is, yeah, it's okay, maybe nothing big, but curious from your perspective. And then also turning to the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, you know, I think I saw recently maybe they can, you know, uh, increase the invest the annual investment, but there's still some questions from some investor council, even on their tax status. So just maybe briefly, if you, as briefly as you can be on these probably wide ranging subjects. I can give you a short version of CRA, especially because we don't really know yet. Like you said, what I can say is we dodged a bullet on the Community Reinvestment Act regulations. The proposed version that we saw a couple of years ago, we know would have been very damaging to the low-income housing tax credit investment because you know, about 80% of the 20, now probably closer to $25 billion LIHTC market is CRA motivated banks. And we, we knew that they were going to eliminate the investment test, unfortunately, which has been the main driver of that investment. But at, as of the original version, there really was no replacement. And also just the weighting of uh, community development activities versus retail. There were just a lot of pieces that would have made other investments much more attractive for banks to meet their CRA obligations. But we and many others in the industry partnered together to make some recommendations for them to take uh, to support housing credit investment, even if they were going to eliminate the investment test. And we started hearing some murmurs before the regs came out that we were going to be happy with the changes they made. But you never know when you hear feedback like that from the regulators. I thought maybe they they took one of our proposals, they actually took about half a dozen. And so there's some really significant improvements, like adding a community development metric for banks over $10 billion, and an impact factor that recognizes housing credit investments. Another significant change, I mentioned the weighting of community development activities. They now give equal weight to retail and community development activities rather than what was proposed as a 60-40 split. So we haven't seen any early signs that anyone is planning to majorly change their investment strategy because of this yet, but it is going to take a while and that could still happen. But it certainly wasn't the case where overnight we started seeing major disruptions in the market, which which was a, a possible outcome. So I think we in the industry who worked to influence these regulations and everyone who's part of that process should be very proud of themselves for at least averting a crisis. And as we see this play out, we'll see if we need to try to go back to get any support. They are final regulations, but they actually state an intention to support affordable housing finance by the low-income housing tax credit. 
And so the door seems open if they do find out if, and if we find out that there are unforeseen issues, that there might be some ability to address them. So I would uh, say short version is bullet dodged. Meanwhile, FHFA has been looking to continue to increase Fannie and Freddie's role in the housing credit investment equity market. So when they first came back a few years ago, they came in at the uh, $500 million level. Then uh, that was increased as part of the Biden administration's whole set of affordable housing changes a couple years ago to $850 million, And now um, they just increased them right before the holidays to a uh, billion dollars each. So they're, they're not trying to uh, crowd out the market. I know that FHFA checks in with the industry regularly to try to right size and make sure what Fannie and Freddie are doing is is helping in underserved markets and and meeting a need that's not otherwise being met in the market and and they're continually checking in. So I was not, not surprised to see this. This is clearly the the direction they've been trying to go in. There is still this tax exempt controlled entity issue hanging out there that hasn't been fully resolved, though it does seem like there might be some solutions short of new treasury guidance that might help to circumvent them. So it's still hanging out there, but there have been some some positive developments on that front as well. Very good. And Emily, one last question for you. And first of all, again, thanks for all the great work the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition and yourself are, are doing. And we know advocacy is needed at all levels and, you know, right now for sure, but you know, the next two years as well and always. And do you have any, and I know actually just, you know, looking at your website, you have toolkits and things like that, but you know, for emails and phone calls, what would you say are some best practices for all of our, you know, listeners both now and then, you know, over the next couple of years? The best practice of all of the toolkits aside is getting members of Congress and policymakers out to see examples of low-income housing tax credit properties in their states and districts, getting to meet the resident, remembering, oh, that corner used to be so run down and now playground and now this, you know, dilapidated school has been turned into senior housing, all of these great examples that Everyone in the industry gets to see and feel every day, but for policymakers who are dealing with a thousand issues and they were just talking about the border and now they're talking about North Korea, it's I think it's easy to miss some of some of this policy that is doing such great work and having such a real impact in their states and districts. So getting them out, getting them to focus on it, to kind of cut through all of the other issues they might be considering on any given day. That's what's really made people supporters, turn supporters into champions. So that regardless of what happens over these next few weeks with the AHCIA, this is a long game that everyone in the industry should be engaged in figuring out how to get them at the grand opening, get them at the groundbreaking. Even if the property's already open, it doesn't need to be a new splashy event, just hey, it's August recess, or what do you know, it's an election year and members of Congress are home all the time looking for ways to actually highlight something positive that's happened <laughs> that Congress has a role in. And they're home in you know all of October, they're home all of August, half of July. Just tell them, hey, did you ever stop by and see that property that we opened a few years ago? You know, we can get a group together to take you around. So it doesn't need to be the you know, the splashy hard hats and, and all that. That's the main thing I think everyone in this industry can be doing all year. If at the time of this recording, there's still a tax bill in the works, definitely keep calling your members of Congress. It is such a long game, which is why, you know, every year we get a few more co-sponsors on the bill. Every year we break through to a, a constituency we hadn't gotten into because it's, you know, it's just this long concerted keeping at it year after year all of us working together. Uh, I do think that there is now working to our advantage what is unfortunately the result of a policy failure that we haven't done more on affordable housing. Members of Congress are hearing about it. I was shocked at some of the conversations we had when the uh, legislation was first introduced in 2023, going into offices, congressional offices in places like South Dakota, Montana, Iowa, saying, you know, when we bring up the topic of affordable housing and what we're there to discuss that day, having them say, oh, that's the number one issue we're hearing about back home. You know, you're used to hearing that in California and New York offices, but it's it's obviously permeated and for so many reasons. So, you know, it's actually a, a 
fun fact that the first state that ran the table with their whole congressional delegation signing on to the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act was Kansas. So it's not it's not this blue state, big city, coastal problem that it maybe used to have the misperception of being. So I encourage everyone, no member of Congress is unpersuadable. There have been ones where even I <laughs> do this every day. We're surprised when they got on, but we get there and uh, it's because of constituents. So, you know, we can go explain the bill to them in DC all day, every day, and we do, but they need to be hearing from uh, from people who actually have the product on the ground and can show them how all the great work that the low-income housing tax credit does. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. That's great information and great advice, Emily. Thank you so much for that. That's it for this episode of The Buzz House. A big thanks to Emily Kotick. Thank you, Emily, for joining us on the show today to cover what's new you know, on the Hill around the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. And once again, I'm Don Bernards. And I'm Garrett Gibson. Thank you for having me. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out BakerTilly.com. If you have a suggestion for the show, email us at buildabakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com. See you next time on Buzz House. Buzz House.